Genesee, how's it going? Yes, no, much better. Allie, thank you for uh, welcoming us this morning. My name's Josh, and I am the pastor here. Like she said, there's 10 Redemption congregations. Just a quick praise report. Redemption Tucson, when COVID hit, they're in Tucson. They were kicked out of their space. They were in this really cool historic school down uh, in Tucson, and they've been kind of looking for space ever since. So they've been couch surfing, as their pastor Dave says. They've been borrowing space on Saturdays. They have basically been in a not ideal situation if you're a church. And this morning is the first chance they've been able to be back in their building, their school that they were meeting in for years prior to this. So I just want to stop and thank God because Joe, our prayer guy, prepared for that. Yeah. So uh, we love them. If you've never met Dave, he's one of the greatest human beings ever. And Marcus, they just hired another guy from Colorado, also is amazing. So I just want to pray and thank God for Tucson. Father, thank you for answering prayers. I know Dave and Marcus and all them have been praying a lot and still praying for you to show up in big ways. We just thank you. We never want to be a f- church family that uh, forgets to stop and count our blessings, not just in-house, but those other redemptions that are affected by uh, all your goodness. So we want to stop and see your goodness. We want to confess you're faithful and you're good. Uh, And we ask for more. We ask for more blessings, specifically for Tucson, for that congregation that they would be able to bless Tucson uh, in their space that they were in prior, and that they would just see uh, abundant blessing in the season, God. So be with them, uh, we ask. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. And now to the text, which is not a rosy text. It kicks off with this. If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. So this uh, passage is uh, sort of a somber look at the life of a Christian through the lens of persecution and hate. And I want to just talk kind of, what are we talking about when we're talking about persecution? There's sort of different ways you can, what's persecution in the world? So currently, uh, there's a Roman Catholic source that believes 70 million Christians have been killed due to persecution in the world. So to give you an estimate, like 70, when numbers get above a million, I'm like, I don't know what that even means. That's like the Holocaust was around 10, 11 million. So seven times the amount of the Holocaust is a conservative estimate of how many Christians have been killed for their faith. And they said it's speeding up in the 20th century and closer to today is where most of those deaths and killings are happening. So it is persecution is here. Hatred is here. It is happening. There's also governmental persecution. So Redemption Gateway, the church I came from, supports people in Turkey. And we have three main people we support. And all three of their wives have been put on mark by the government. And they had to leave because they were going to be ex- kicked out of the country because they married foreign wives. And why? 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 Why does that happen? Because they're faithful Christian pastors. One study says about 111 countries in the world have laws that sort of hinder and persecute Christianity specifically. So we could live sort of in that world and like one day when we face stuff that hard, will we have what it takes? And I think that's part of it. But I think most of us, if you're like me, live sort of normal lives, sort of like I just kind of do my normal things week to week. Where am I facing persecution just in normal life? Where is being a Christian kind of sticking my neck out there where I'm taking shots that I don't want to be taking? And there's a picture I have in my head of this, 2016, fall of 2016, so rewind back then, there's a lot going on, there's all this immigration talk in Arizona specific, there's a presidential election going before, remember these guys, you know, Trump and Hillary, it was a good time, 2016 was a blast, and I used to be a high school teacher, and I was going to lunch with former students of mine, uh, who were all Hispanic and all had like really strong opinions about immigration and how it should be done in Arizona, and very hurt by a lot of policy. And I go to lunch with them, and just to kind of break the air, I'm like, so you guys going to get Trump tattoos today? Like, just trying to be awkward and break the silence. And nobody laughed. <laughs> and one guy in particular kind of got a little quiet. And I talked to after. I'm like, hey, man, you seem a little different. And he's the only Christian of the bunch. He said, I'm just having a hard time because I think I'm going to vote for him. Not based off immigration stuff, but based off other stuff that I feel like is important to my faith. And he was basically like, when I think of persecution, being a Christian in this world, that's kind of the picture I have. Like, in a social setting where you love Jesus, you're trying to faithfully follow Jesus, he's calling you into things that are not going to be popular, and the second you say it or vote it or stamp it or do anything with it, you know it's going to be like, you! Why is that true? Because this verse is true. If the world hates you, know that it's hated me first. And that's the life of a Christian, is walking in 
to hate and to persecution. And not, this isn't a political thing. This is a, what does it mean to faithfully follow Jesus? Jesus would say this. It's going to take a lot from you. Here's my big idea. Simplified it down as best I could. If you want to follow Jesus, don't be surprised when you are hated like Jesus. If you want to follow Jesus, great. I want all the benefits. Great. You also get all the stuff that he says is going to come your way. Persecution and hate is one of them. So I want to walk through this passage, and I'm going to see three things. Here's what we're going to look at. We're going to look at the reasons for the hate. We're going to look at, this is not necessarily from the text, but just from being a human. What are poor responses we have to the hate? And then back in the text, what are some faithful ways we can respond to the hate? So there's hate. How are we going to respond? The haters going to hate. What are Christians going to do about it? We're going to walk through this. So here's the first thing we need to look at. Three reasons why followers of Jesus will be hated. So Genesis just read it. Let's go back to the very beginning of this passage. Chapter 15, verse 18 and 19. What does Jesus say to us? He says this, if the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own, but because you were not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. So if you're a note taker, the Three reasons why. Here's the first reason. Because you are not of the world. Why does the world hate you? Because you're not of the world. Simply. Jesus says you're not of the world. What's the world? Cosmos is the Greek word. It's the same word in John 3, 16. God so loved the world. So sometimes he says world and he means the people of the world. But oftentimes as you read the New Testament, when they say world, what they're meaning is sort of the ethos, the feel the operating system of the world we currently live in. And that world, that operating system, hates us. I think, of like, <laughs> we, I think of an operating system. So we got Mac people, we've got the other people. We've got people who love Macs, and we've got those other people. My dad's those other people. It's a different operating system. My dad calls me a lot for computer help. And he told me the other day, man, your sermon's like, you've been saying sweet things about me. So here's the thing that annoys me most about my dad. He doesn't know how to work a computer. He has Microsoft. He doesn't know how to work Microsoft, which is just a joke. And he calls me all the time like, hey, how do I, what do I do? How do I turn this thing off? I'm like, dad, this is, oh my gosh, you are <laughs> 50 years old. Change your operating system. Here's what Jesus means. The operating system of the world is what it is. And it's against Christianity. Here's how some different leaders of the early church would describe it, just to give us sort of different uh, angles at this. So James 4.4, 4, that's the brother of Jesus, says this, You adulterous people, you, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. James, brother of Jesus, would say, You can be a friend of God or you can be a friend of the world. You can't be friends with both which is what we want. Like a lot of us want to thread the needle, I'm included, of being friends with the world, friends with Jesus. He says, you can be this or you can be this. It's not a needle to thread. It's a fence that you're on and you're going to fall off into one or the other. You're a friend of this or you're a friend of God. What does Peter say? Peter says this, for the time that is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do. Here's what life as a Gentile in the world is like living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and lawless idolatry. With respect to this, they are surprised when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery, and they will malign you. So James says, calls it friendship. Uh, Peter here calls it the actions of the world, and they want you to participate, and when you don't, they will malign you because you're not of the world. Paul says it this way about the world. He sort of gives a theological overview. He takes 11 chapters in the book of Romans, and then 12, he's like, all right, here's what to do with this, and here's his first sort of practical application. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. How does he describe the world? The world is conforming us. It's squeezing us. It is not a neutral factor. It is coming for us. It is sort of like a current under the water that is moving us all in a direction away from God. And he says, do not be conformed. It's like we used to love to go to San Diego. We used to have a place there. Not us personally, but a sister that lived there, and now she moved. But we'd go to Dog Beach, Ocean Beach, every time. 
my wife and I would sit down in our chairs, get our California burrito, and read books and say, kids, stay right here. And then we'd put our heads down for hours, and we'd look up, and they're like, way down here. Why? Because the current is moving them. And here's what Paul says. There is a current. Nobody is smart enough to outthink the world's operating system and function outside of it. Nobody is strong enough to function in that current and do what needs to be done. It is just a current that is there. The world's operating system is against God, against the people of God, and it's moving fast. Therefore, reason number one, we're hated because we're not of that world's system. Here's the second thing. We are also hated because we are not greater than our master. Go to verse 20. Jesus, again, is talking to his 11 disciples. Judas is gone. He's preparing them for world life without him. Verse 20, remember the word that I said to you. A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute, persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. Pause right, pause right there. What is Jesus saying? If you want to follow me, you're going to be treated like I was treated. And he sort of says two things. If they persecuted me, they'll persecute you. But he also says, if they kept my word, they'll keep yours. In the sense, they're going to do bad stuff to you. And also, as you preach the gospel, bring the gospel, be a faithful steward where you're at, in your neighborhoods, in your workplace, in your homes, with your family members that do not love Jesus. Some of them will receive the word from you, just like people have with me. But just know you get both. It's not just this. It's not just the bad stuff either, but it's going to be this. You are not greater than your master. You will live a life like Jesus. One of the most beautiful illustrations of this is CCV's founding pastor, CCV. If you don't know what it is, you're not from Phoenix. It is the church. It's everywhere. It's huge. It's awesome. The founding pastor, Don Wilson, one of my best friends, mentor types, he's a really good friend, was on their elder board for a while. I'm like, what's Don like? You know, I'm never going to be a part of anything that big. What's he like? He's like, he's a servant. What do you mean? He's like, every elder meeting, every time we kind of have dinner with our wives or whatever, he's like the guy bussing the tables, always. Why? Because the servant is not greater than his master. And Don's like, if I'm going to follow Jesus, I'm going to follow Jesus in the way of servanthood. Here's what stinks about this passage. Most people are okay with a servant opportunity they've chosen. Or they've picked. It's like the kids' workers. is like, all right, Josh told me. I prayed about it. I didn't hear anything, but I'm going to go serve in one to four-year-olds. <sighs> and they go. And you can get muster up enough to serve in an area that you've chosen. Here's what's hard with persecution and hatred that is without cause. You don't know when it's coming. You don't know how hard it's coming. You don't know how last it's going to long. It's all this stuff you don't really, you can't brace for. And it hits you. And Jesus says, just so you know, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you. That is the life of being a follower of Jesus. Jesus says, I was hated. I suffered. I was the most mislabeled human being. I am the most mislabeled human being in the history of the world. That is the life you are following into as you decide to follow me. And he gives one more reason. What's the third reason we are hated? It's we are hated because people just don't know our Father. Where do I see that? Go to verse 21. We are hated because people do not know the Father. But all these things they will do to you on account of my name. Why? Because they do not know him who sent me. Unpack that a little bit, Jesus. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not have been guilty of sin. But now they have no excuse for their sin. Whoever hates me hates my father also. If I had not done among them the works that no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. But now they have seen and hated both me and my father. That is a major theme of John. Why do people hate Jesus? Because people were in the darkness, and darkness loves darkness. And hates the light. Those who don't know the Father hate anything of the Father. Why are we hated? Because they do not know the Father. They, they don't know the Father. Jesus says, verse 22, they don't know the words that I spoke. And everything I spoke was from the Father. Here's what's crazy about Jesus. Jesus lived a life where nothing he said was his own. He took everything from the Father and brought it to a world in love and grace and truth. And he brought it. It's like uh, this illustration we were counseling this couple in a same-sex marriage, and we were just walking through 
here's what I think God is calling you to. If you want to follow Jesus, and it means this can't continue, said, but we feel like God has given us the words that we're supposed to say. It's like there's a chef back there. God is the chef. He's preparing all things. We're just waiters, and we're going to get what God has prepared, and we need to bring it out and present it and say, this is what God says. And Jesus is the only human to do that perfectly. Everything he ever said was received from the Father and given to the world, but the world did not know the Father. Therefore, they hate Jesus, and they hate us, and we're called to the same life of taking from the Father that which the world does not want and giving it to them over and over and over again and over. Like here's a, conf- I, as I was preparing the sermon, I had, kind of had a self-confession because as a church plant, you want to reach the community, you want to reach people who are far from Jesus, and yet as I get older, I've been in the faith now 20 years probably, give or take, the people I like being around most are Christians. And it's for this reason. The thing I love most in this world, the gospel, the person I love most, Jesus, the things I care about most come from this book. Everything in me is growing. And again, it's a process. It's slow. But everything about me is falling more and more in love with Jesus. And as you go out into the world and you're friends with people and you want to connect on a sort of non-surface level deeper, when Jesus isn't there, it gets hard to stay in the relationship. So I think we all got to just confess if we're followers of Jesus like, God, I don't think you want us just to kind of hole up and just be with people who love you. But it is hard. And it gets difficult to stay in conversations about NASCAR in general, but let alone. Like, what, can we talk about Jesus? Huh. I don't know Jesus or his father is the world we've been sent into. That's why the world hates us. Now, how do we respond to this? The world is, Jesus gives this so that we, we know it's coming. How do we respond? I have three poor responses that I am guilty of, and I think people in this room will probably be guilty of. What are three responses we may have? Here's the first one. We can be surprised by it. Here's how it goes down in the Watt House. This is what the most frustrating thing my kids do right now. Without a close second, I tell them something that does not line up with what they want to be doing then at all, like, Dad, can we play extra Fortnite? No. Dad, can I have candy for breakfast? No. Dad, can I stay up an hour late? No. Dad, can I go? And I say no. And then here's, I don't know where it started, probably one of your kids. Here's what happens. (laughs) They go, what? (laughs) What? And they think it's a joke now, but it is so annoying. It's like, I am shocked that my parents would tell me anything other than exactly what I want to do. What? And Christians kind of live this like, what? My boss treats me awkwardly? What? My neighbor kind of avoids me? What? I lost out on that bid? What? I got pushed out of that company? What? What did you expect? Jesus would say. Like, 15 verse 8. If the world hates you, know that it hated me before it hated you. It's coming. And then chapter 16, verse 1. The reason he's saying this is to prepare us for the what moments. 16, verse 1 says this. I have said all these things to you to keep you from falling away. They're going to put you out of synagogues. They're going to kill you in the name of God. But just so you know, I'm saying these to keep you from falling away. Not losing the faith, but like stumbling to the point of like, what? This is going to happen. Do not be surprised. This is how it goes down. Like, I remember the first time I faced this as a, I don't even think I was a Christian yet, but my dad was becoming a Christian, was a Christian, was all on fire. Jesus, 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 Jesus. And the girl I was dating in high school, her brother was like the Christian guy. And I thought he was a nerd. I thought he was lame. I thought he was meek. I thought he was mild. I thought he was gentle. I thought he was all these things that apparently the Bible says, you should try to be these things. (laughs) And I told dad, like, I don't know. Everybody walks all over that guy. He's pathetic. Well, what do you mean, son? You know, like, people make fun of him. He doesn't say anything back. And he's just kind of weak. Like, he's like, he sounds kind of like Jesus to me. (laughs) And then mic drop moment from dad. Like, that's what we're after. And I was surprised that the Christian life was going to involve that. And Jesus says, that's what it's like. Don't be surprised. That's what happened to me. I was the creator of the universe. 
And my highlight moment on earth is naked on a cross. Don't expect to have something different. So the first thing we can do is be surprised. Jesus says don't. Here's the second thing, and this gets personal real quick. We can retaliate. We can get back. We just had a counselor give sort of a training to our small group leaders, and, you know, they talk about fight or flight. The bra- that's how the brain works. That's how humans work. There's like this natural inclination to fight or to flight. We can, or we can run away. And that's sort of every social interaction we're all trying to navigate is fight or flight. And the disciples show us that's no different with following Jesus, like Peter. He's ready to fight. He takes up his sword. They come to arrest Jesus, and he swings for the head, and he misses, and he chops off the ear. The dude's like, bro. Another instance, there's a disciple, naked, running away. He doesn't even say his name. He's like, he just ran off with his clothes, rather than be associated with Jesus in that moment. What do we take from that? As a disciple of Jesus, as a follower, we're all going to have tendencies to fight, Peter-like, and run away, embarrassed-like. But we fight. I mean, this is my thing. I want to fight. I want to fight. It's in my bones i come from very fired up irish mexican family like they just fight good that's the best thing they do and i want to fight and now jesus says "Eh, it's not the best way i was trying to think through like what does this look like in our day and age because it's a messy world but like specifically how do i see this navigating the christian world here's the first thing here's how we fight we can push back and defend our name and our cause whenever it's brought up Somebody brings up something negative towards me or my church or Jesus or, hey, knock it off. We could defend our cause. Here's how I see it in my life, and this is sort of a personal story um, of just development I'm still in. 2020 was fun, right? Good times. As a church leader, it was a blast. Trying to navigate COVID, racial tensions, election, to name a few. I remember being in multiple conversations where I felt like I was being attacked. Not necessarily for my faith, but I'm a white guy. Like, over and over and over again, I was in these situations. And I was like, I just felt it in me, like, ah. And what do I do? Is that the right response? If you go online and check social media, hey, should I defend myself? Heck yes! Here's where I landed, and I'm la- trying to land is I think for me to stay in important yet hard conversations around race and all these things, I have to be willing to sort of take shots that I don't think are fair all the time, to stay in the conversation long enough to get to like the good stuff of other people's hearts and their stories and navigating that space. I think Christianity is the only worldview in the world that allows you the, the stamina to be able to stay in hard conversations long enough to do that. But my natural inclination is like to fight. Like I'm really quick on my feet. My mom's the most witty person in the world. She'd pass it on to me. I could, I could do this. And I'd be like, no, 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 chill. You don't need to defend yourself all the time. Chill. You can listen. Here's the other thing. And I see this more and more, and I, I don't see it in our church a lot, but I see it in Christianity at large. We can enjoy being the hated ones. It's like, the world's going to hate us. Yeah. Yeah. It's like this badge of honor that we are the hated ones in this world it's like i don't think that's what jesus is wanting for me like that's what i taught my kids to do before their soccer match like yeah i'm gonna go destroy those other six-year-olds that's not what jesus told us to do with the world that's mad at us like it's like the kobe bright mentality everybody's an enemy and all any perceived slight i'm gonna take it i'm gonna run with it. i'm gonna destroy that person in christianity it's like creeped in it like yeah the world says we suck the world's gonna hate us yeah it's like, I think it's a more sobering, like, sad, the world's going to hate us. We ready for this crew? And then we leave out of here prayerfully dependent on the spirit. We can go looking for fights. I see this a lot. Like, let's just go looking for fights. Like, picking fights about everything. Like, political, Christian, like, I just, I'm the person that God put on this earth to find good fights, and to win those fights. A lot of people think that way, and I don't think that's a Christian thing to do. Here's what I would say. I prayed a lot about this sermon. Um, I think the political discourse 
and the Christian discourse have been so jumbled up together that it's confusing to even know what's going on currently. Like, here's what I mean by that. My kids, well, Ozzy now loves Play-Doh. And Play-Doh is great for one time. And then after it's been open, it's terrible. So Play-Doh, you got the pink, you got the yellow, you got the blue, the green, the black. You got all these wonderful bright colors. And then the kids take the lids off and then they put it all together. And then it's just globs of gross, nasty, gross stuff. And then the kid takes that and puts it in the pink and puts it in that. And that's what I feel like Christianity and the political discourse, it's all jumbled up together. Like, it's not all the same. Conservative hate of liberals is not a Christian thing. It's different. Now, there's Christians who are conservative, Christians who are liberals who are experiencing that and should fight for what they want to fight for based off that, but it's not all the same. Some people hate conservatives because they're liberal, period. Some people hate liberals because they're liberal, period. Jesus says they will hate you because of me. And I think we need to learn how to get out of this melee. Just us in the room. I'm not talking about anyone else. How do we walk into this politically charged world of Play-Doh mixed up and live with these labels people are throwing out and still be faithful? I think part of it is not mixing it all up and saying, is this something coming at me because of my faith in Jesus or is this because of my fiscal policy? Not the same. Love of Jesus Love of economic security and fiscal responsibility. Good ideas, but not the same. Don't mix them up. We can retaliate. That's one way. Or we can do this. We can retreat. We can just run away. I don't want to deal with it. And I want to call out two specific people in this room. You're like, is he going to say my name right now? Possibly. Here's how I describe this group. Comfort lovers. That's me, and people pleasers. Comfort lovers, people who want the comfort of this life without the cross that Jesus asks us to carry. And it comes in a lot of different shapes and varieties. Here's one way I'm seeing it more and more in my sort of Christian subculture world. I'm hanging out with my good buddies. We're all kind of in our late 30s. We all got saved around the same time, kind of 18 to early 20s, and we've all been navigating the faith together since. And one of my friends said, I just want to live in a little Christian town with Christian values. And I'm like, I just want to go, you know, there's somebody in this room like, I just want to go to the woods in a cabin, surround myself with Christian things and be done with this world. That would be retreat. God has called you to Phoenix and all the gunk and junk that comes with being in the city of Phoenix. Phoenix. If he calls you to a small little town, he's calling you to the small little town annoying stuff that you don't like, just like you don't like here, too. But God is not calling us. I even heard, I'm an eavesdropping. I'm a great eavesdropper. I'm at soccer practice the other day, and I hear these ladies talking. I'm like, this sounds interesting. And they basically <laughs> said the same thing. I just, I just want to get out of here. I'm sick of it. One said, yeah, I'm at church the other day. I was talking about this. And yeah, we sh- I just want to go to a place that's kind of Christian, whatever the heck that means. Where they sell Christian candy and they do the thing and they listen to Christian music and everybody just kind of frolics around. I, that doesn't exist. And that's retreat. And that's seeking comfort. And that's something I battle with. I tried to write down a confession that you comfort lovers like myself can confess out loud. It's very harsh, but if you want, here. When you're feeling this, you could say, I want to be more comfortable right now, Jesus. I don't want the life of my master. I'd prefer the comfort that those that killed my master had. I want the life of Rome. I don't want the life of the cross. That's not an option, and yet it's a struggle all of us have, especially in a country that has had such Christian sort of values sprinkled around. It's like, I want to get back to something like that. It's like, that doesn't exist. What about people pleasers? People pleasers, you guys raise your hand just to please me because you're like, I don't want to do that. And I was convicted by this by Twitter like a month ago. Some of my most profound moments in my life have come from tweets, which is insane. But this is another one. So through all the political discourse, all the discussions, all trying to navigate how to talk with people. Now, I've kind of come to the conclusion, like, I don't want to share my strong thoughts on stuff. Because I I care about the friendship and I care about sharing the gospel. Some would call that friendship evangelism, whatever. 
But his point was like, I used to believe in friendship evangelism where I wouldn't share like my strong thoughts on this or my strong thoughts on the economy or my strong thoughts on child rearing or my strong thoughts because I wanted to get to the point where I could share the gospel. That's what I was for. He's like, and I realized what I'm becoming, fr- the people that are becoming friends with me are becoming friends with a perceived picture of me, not the real me. And he said, I've realized I need to start sharing that, not to get in fights, but just to have authentic, true friendship and relationship because if there's stuff about your friends you disagree with and you leave you are a terrible friend all of us want to be true friends with and we all have stuff that all of us disagree with and think is crazy and I just realized oh yeah I'm I don't know what people pleasing what it is but I I need to be more bold with my convictions now I've got to carry wisdom as a pastor and not get all in worlds I need to be don't need to be speaking into but as a person as just a faithful disciple of Jesus I need to be able to have hard conversations and not worry about what they're going to think about me because I believe this. Here's a question I wrote just for both groups. Do you want comfort or conformity? It's sort of just an assessment question to give in any situation. Do I want comfort now or conformity? I'm at work tomorrow. I know that thing's going to be brought up. I'm talking to that person. I know they're going to say something I disagree with. Do I want comfort or conformity? And that can press on us in different ways. But that's the question. Do you want just to be comfortable or do you want to be conformed into the image of Jesus through suffering, hate, and persecution just like he did? Here's my encouragement, though. Some of the greatest moments, the highest highs of your life will be when you press into these hard situations, these hateful moments, this persecution. It'll also be some of your lowest moments. The cross is the greatest moment in human history and the most sad moment in human history. And that's what Jesus is asking us to walk into as we step into this hateful world. So those are three wrong, false, poor ways to respond. What are some faithful responses that we can have as we navigate a world that hates us because it hates Jesus? Here's the first one. You can remember to check yourself. What do I mean by that? Go to verse 25. Remember to check yourself. My mom used to say that. Check yourself, boy. But the word that is written in their law must be fulfilled. They hated me without cause. Pause right there. That is a prophecy about the life of Jesus. It says about Jesus, they will hate him without cause. Here's what's true of every moment, every interaction, every relationship Jesus ever had. He never had cause to actually be hated. They hated me without cause from the beginning of my life to the end of my life and my resurrection on for eternity. No one will ever have a cause against me. Here's what we can do as Christians. We can stop and say that verse is not true of me necessarily. I think Jesus is giving it to us as the church, as his disciples to say there, there's going to be an element of this world's hate that is a get, it's without cause. It won't make sense because it's going to be tied up in the person of Jesus and their hate of him. Just so you know, there's going to be lots of moments where it's not about you or what you've done. But individually, personally, collectively as a church, we can say, is there something I've done here that's causing this? It's Jesus saying, hey, did you look at the thing in your eye before you picked out the toothpick that that guy has in his eye? Like, have you checked yourself first? So here's how we can do this. Think of the last one or two times you've felt the hate or persecution that Jesus is describing here. And not to keep putting people pleasers on blast, but if you can't really think of any, that's like further affirmation. Like, I don't ever really say anything that's offensive enough to get any hate, which is not the life we've been called to. We're not called to be jerks, but we're called to be faithful. But think back. I mean, I can think back to interactions with neighbors. We move in. We're like, yeah, we're church people. And it's like, oh, you're one of those. You are bigoted. You are this. You are this. You are this. Whoa, 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 whoa. We just met like six minutes ago. But as I navigate my relationships with them and I feel attacked and feel what Jesus is saying, I've realized that I'm not praying for them nearly like I did when I first moved in. Check yourself. Is it you? Is it? Here's a psalm that I've read over a few hard conversations I've had to give or enter into. It's Psalm 12, verse 6. It says this, The words of the Lord are pure words, like silver refined in a furnace on the ground, purified seven times and ask God purify these words I know I'm flawed purify these words or I look back on a conversation and think where was there not purification where was there refining you had to do oh yeah and I have so many opportunities to see that in my life you may be different than me but my mouth is the thing that gets me in trouble a lot purify my words Psalm 12 6 just check 
yourself. Tom Schrader is the founding pastor of this church. He's since passed away. But one of his final messages I heard him give was hilarious. He was basically calling out young people. He's like, all these young people are into self-awareness. They're all taking these personality tests and Enneagram and yada, yada, yada. He's like, self-awareness is a joke. I'm like, what? I, I'm pretty self-aware. What are you saying? And he basically said this, which is such great old guy wisdom. Self-awareness is a joke because everybody gives themselves the benefit of the doubt. You could be self-aware all day long, but at the end of the day, when push comes to shove, it's like, yeah, but I'm in there. You know, it's that. We all do that. <laughs> but I'm, you know, in there. You know, you know, ever, that's all of us. We give ourselves the benefit of the doubt, but check yourself. At least get in the habit of like, when I felt hate or persecution, is there anything I've contributed? There's persecution all over the board that is not our fault, but there's some that we've kind of invited in or caused ourselves. Here's the second thing. We can remember their guilt. How does God describe the non-Christian, the world, in this setting? He does not describe it like an angry person who just got in a fight with someone and says, oh, they're annoying, they're fresh, like we do. What's that guy like who's a non-Christian who keeps causing you issues at work? We have all these sort of visceral responses to what we think of them. God's is very judicial. Let's just read verse 22 to 24. How does God see the world that is in current hatred of him? Verse 22, if I had not come and spoken to them, they would not have been guilty of sin. But now they have no excuse for their sin. Whoever hates me hates my father also. If I had not done among them the works that no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. But now they have seen and hated both me and my father. What is the non-Christian world described as, according to God in this? Guilty and full of sin. So as we Christians, listen to me, as we navigate these situations where we are treated unfairly because of our faith, that's a problem, I get it. But the bigger problem at play is this, they are guilty before God currently. And even Jesus says they're adding guilt in these situations where Jesus is being presented and they're rejecting it. Guilt is being added to them. Like the Raiders just had this receiver who has this DUI and going to have vehicular homicide. Just a super sad story. And then I read the news this morning and more charges are coming. It's like the worst charge is already there. Non-Christians in this room, if you are not placing your faith in Jesus right now, you are separate from him. Your guilt rests on you. The way God sees you is guilty and full of sin, and sin is getting added. That is your main problem. That is the main problem when we navigate the world that hates us and persecutes us. There is guilt there. So as Christians, what do we do with that? We find it, I'll get all, it breaks our heart. It takes us to the third and final thing. Here's what I think is the most faithful thing we do. We can remember what Jesus did with our guilt. Like that's the, even go to verse 26 here. This is what Jesus says is going to happen when we face these moments, these people, these situations, these companies, these bosses, these neighbors that persecute and hate us. But when the helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, what's he going to do in these moments? He will bear witness about me. What do we need most in these moments where we face hate, in persecution? Do we need a sort of how-to manual on how to get this? Do we need apologetic training to sort of fend them off? Do we need more theological training to squash them? Do we need uh, conversation skills? What do we need? It says the Spirit's going to do this. It's going to bear witness about me to them and to you. And what's he going to bear witness about? Like, what do we picture when Jesus comes to mind when we're in these situations? I was once lost. I was once in the world that hated him. I was once so apathetic to Jesus, it's embarrassing. And how did Jesus respond to my hatred, my apathy of him? He did not fight me. He did not come after me. He went to a cross willingly, and he died, killed by hands he created, laid on a cross, bare, naked, ashamed in front of the world that he created. And when Jesus says, you will face hate and persecution, but the Spirit will bear witness about me, he's telling us Christians, he will remind you the cost that Jesus paid for you and for I. My favorite kids book, The Garden, the Curtain, and the Cross. The refrain throughout, if you don't have it, you need to buy it, even if you're 80 years old. 
Because of our sin, we can't come in. 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 But Jesus on the cross made a way for us to be brought into relationship with him. How did it happen? How was the hate in this world conquered? It was through a loving, submissive, sacrificial, undeserved death on a cross. And now Jesus says, I invite you into that life. The next verse says, now you will go bear witness likewise. That's our call, Christians. It's not what we wanted. It's not what got us into the faith. But now that we're in the faith as followers of Jesus, Jesus says this, they will hate you just like they hated me. But I will send my spirit, my helper, and he will bear witness about me. When you need it, exactly how you need it. Amen? We're in this together. It's I don't know how hard it is for you, but I'm experiencing more and more the cross of Jesus as I try to live faithfully. So let's do this together. Let's pray. Jesus, so much of the Christian reality is beautiful and glorious and hope-inducing and creates a level of expectation and desire for better things. And then there are aspects of the Christian life that we wish we could Uh, take out of our Bible and we'd write it otherwise. This is one of those. So God, as a church, as followers of you, help us to be faithful. Help us to not go looking for fights, but not to run from them. Help us to go looking for people to love, even though it will cost us persecution and reviling and maligning and name-calling, and awkward conversations. Not because we will earn anything by doing, but we will experiencing, experience more of the life that you've laid before us, a life that is shaped by the cross and your crucifixion, one that is of laying your life down for the sake of others. God, this is not natural to anyone, so we plead for your spirit to make it more real in our life. In Jesus' name we pray.